All right, this is Patrick Rogers, and today we have the privilege to have Santiago Halti on the show. And Santiago is the CEO of Senda Athletics. Welcome to the show, Santiago. Thank you for having me, Patrick. Excited to be here. Yeah, man. Can't wait to dive in. So Santiago holds a BA in economics degree from University of San Diego, UC San Diego. He studied international relations and business at Funden University in Shanghai, China, and sustainable development and social responsibility metrics at Sciences Po in Paris, France. Uh, he's a co-founder uh, and CEO of Senda Athletics, which launched in 2010, right, to offer top quality fair trade certified soccer balls. I know there's a journey here, we're going to get into it, but since then, the company has become the leading U.S. brand for futsal, a rapidly growing five-a-side version of soccer, so a very niche market there, and expanded since then into footwear, premium grip socks, and bespoke team uniforms. Senda's products, are, they're sold in best-in-class retailers, so some top retailers out there like Dick Sporting Goods, he's on Amazon, he's on Soccer.com, and some other specialty stores. So, Santiago, it's great to have you. Before we dive into Senda Athletics and your journey, man, what's one interesting fact about yourself that not many people know? I speak Chinese. Uh, I had the chance to study Chinese ahead of uh, studying abroad in 2008 in uh, Shanghai. And uh, when I go to, to visit factories and, and suppliers and partners there, it's, it kind of catches them by, by surprise to, 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 to hear me speak in Chinese. Wow. Uh, okay, so how long were you there again? So I was in, in China one full year, all of 2008. It was a wonderful year because the Olympics were taking place in Beijing. So oh, wow. the world kind of came into, into one city. I had a chance to see Argentina, my home country, um, win the, the soccer tournament during the Olympics. I got to see the U.S. Dream Team and meet people from all over the world and kind of see a very historic moment in, in China. And it was, it was a wonderful year, really. That's so awesome, man. So did you... Did you learn Chinese in just that one year or were you like studying before, studying after as well? I studied before. I knew I wanted to go to China because I knew oh, okay. that they were going to really change the, the the economic balance of the right. world sure, and the political sure. balance. I'm like, I want to be there. So I studied one year ahead of the trip. And then when I went there, I, I took daily classes. It wasn't required by my program, uh, but I, I went and I talked to somebody at the university and I said, I want to take two hours of Chinese every day. And they put me into a class that was outside of my program and that's how, how I was able to, to, to learn the language. Brilliant, man. Brilliant. So how, how critical has that been or, or how, <clears throat> how much of a benefit is that for you being able to speak the language? And, and so now you're, are, are, you, are your manufacturing facilities actually in China then? That's one of the countries we manufacture uh, our footwear on our grip socks in China and then our um, fair trade certified soccer balls. It's in Pakistan. Um, but when I go to China and I'm able to talk to um, some of the managers and and I can get by, right? I, I cannot talk, um, of, you know, about Confucian philosophy in Chinese. Sure, um, yeah, but yeah. I can, but I understand numbers. I I can have a conversations about the basic, um, you know, business topics that we need to discuss, and and that helps a lot. It helps us, you know, with my team when we have to navigate, uh, you know, traveling in the country and eating at restaurants and talking with the factories. It, I think it gives us a level of um, credibility and authenticity with the suppliers. And I think it, for them, it's 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 humbling to have somebody try to speak the language when you know almost everybody there is, expects them to to speak in English speak only. Speak English, yeah, yeah. They probably they probably uh, makes them feel good and and that you that you respect them enough to really give an effort towards that. Absolutely, and you get a lot of smiles from people too, and, and uh, that's that's cool. amazing. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that, man. So um, so tell us more about Send Athletics and your journey, man. Yeah, absolutely. So I was actually born here in the States um, um, from an Argentine family. Both my mom and dad um, are Argentines right. and um, um, was born actually in Indio, California. Um, and when I was four years old, we moved back to Buenos Aires, Argentina. And that's where I grew up playing soccer. Basically, every free moment that I was not in school, I was kicking a ball, you know, during recess, right, right after lunch, after school. Um, every birthday was a was a soccer party. Like that's all we did, um, and I learned a lot of life lessons through the sport. You know how to win, how to lose, um, how to respect your opponents, um, and you know all of the things that sport can can teach us. So um, after finishing high school in Argentina, I moved to San Diego to go to school, and I left um, all my family behind. And um, soccer was really how I was able to make new friends and build my community in the States and, 
I was very homesick. I was very family oriented, still am. And it was not easy um, to to leave my country. So soccer taught me, um, you know, how to meet new people in San Diego from Brazil, from Africa, from Argentina, from Uruguay. Um, and sport of soccer is really a unifying force. So that's when I started to see that soccer was was more than just a sport and more than just a game, and that it was a force for for a better good and, and a force that had changed my life um, forever. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic, man. So so talk about. Um your journey and you started in 2010 kind of walk us through how you got from from where you were in 2010 to where you are now yeah absolutely so um right at, around that time i had finished um, my studies in paris in france yeah. at, Sciences, at um, Sciences Po. Um, and europe is already um, very advanced in everything that's related to sustainability and fair trade and organic mm -hmm. cotton so over there i saw that the market was very much going that way you had fashion brands that were getting into fair trade. It wasn't just um, as common as, as um, you know, only in food. Um, right, right, right. It was the already necessities. Ahead. Exactly. So, um, and I should probably take a step back here and explain what fair trade is as, as we get into it. So fair trade basically is a system that certifies that the products that are being made oftentimes in third world countries, but now also in the United States, products like vegetables, and, and now it's getting into dairy even, that the people that are making these products are, are treated fairly, that they're getting a good wage, um, that there's no child labor, uh, and that people have improved working conditions. So right, all that right. is certified by okay. the nonprofits. Um, so I saw that that was very developed in Europe. So when I graduated uh, in Paris, uh, I decided to come back to the States. I moved to Berkeley, California, um, and I started um, this project to start making fair trade certified soccer balls. They're basically, I knew that you could make this product fair trade. And I'm like, soccer is the world's game. It only makes sense that the people that are allowing us to enjoy the beautiful game, uh, that they're treated fairly. I don't want to play with a ball that maybe was done with child labor or poor working conditions. So I right. talked uh, with the nonprofit organization that audits the factory. Um, and they gave me a list of factories in Pakistan. There's hundreds of factories, but only about eight of them had mm. been certified fair trade. So I contacted eight of those factories. I heard back from four of them. Two of them agreed to make samples, and one of them had the better quality samples. And that's how it, I was started. In 2011, um, we received the first shipment of 750 balls. It was three models, 250, the minimum order quantity in each model. And, and that's how Senda was starting December of 2010, January of 2011. Yeah. Wow, man, that's awesome. And so I think you had said that when you, when you first went after this, that just going after soccer in general was just, was just way too wide. And you were actually, you were, you were not seeing the results you wanted to see. Absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, you, I, we saw this huge market that is soccer and we thought that sure. bringing a sustainability factor to it would be a big enough differentiator right, um, for us right. to, 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 to earn a space in, in the market. And um, we had some early adopters and the Bay Area was a wonderful place to start. We started working with um, youth clubs that uh, made custom balls with us, but we're not really getting enough traction. And about a year into uh, being in business, we started uh, making balls because we listened to our customers um, for um, futsal, uh, which is a five-a-side version of soccer and, and that's when really we found a niche market that was um, unattended, that people were not paying enough attention. And that's when things started to accelerate quickly, Patrick. So, so what was going on though, after, you know, you were, you were a year in business, right? And, and so what was, you said you listened to your customers, but what, what kind of traction were you guys getting? What kind of results, what kind of sales were you getting uh, as a company at that time? Yeah, it was very much like a door-to-door a -door sales. You know, I would go to a lot of the youth clubs in the in the Bay okay. Area and sustainability okay. resonates a lot with those clubs. But I wasn't able to get, say, in a soccer.com or an Amazon. I wasn't to get some of the okay. bigger retailers. Because right. um, so, um, you're, you're competing with every other soccer manufacturer out there and they, they weren't seeing enough of a difference in your balls versus, you know, the, 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 the big guys, big boys. I, Exactly. The sustainability part wasn't big enough. You know, now I and I've learned, you know, in all these years that that the fair trade is the cherry on top, that, you know, people are not going to buy a product just because it's sustainable or fair trade or organic. It has to be as good mm. as anything else. It has to be a similar value, maybe a small premium, but not too much. 
Uh, yeah. The people will maybe impulse, they will say they're willing to pay more, but when, in, on the shelves and when they're online, that, that might be less than what people are saying publicly. And so you have to offer the same level of quality and convenience than anybody else. Uh, and then that's a cherry on top. So would you say that the, the uh, they're not even really your competitors, but the, but the big guys who were doing, I don't even know what companies are the big soccer ball manufacturers, but um, would you say that those companies are fair trade? Um, they're not fair trade, you know, like to really? be fair, yeah, to be fair okay. trade, you have to go through a, an right, audit, that whole process. audit process and you have to be willing to pay a premium. So for every ball that we buy, we pay an extra premium sure. uh, that goes to a fund that the workers themselves in the factories, uh, in this case, in Pakistan, they decide how to use it. So they've done backpacks for the children of the workers. They've done eye exam for the workers. They've done clean water projects. So in order for you to be fair trade, it it's not something that you just do. It has to be something that you do with a lot of intention and you have to be willing to spend the time on extra money in order to, to, to have that impact. Sure. So do you think, so, so it was about a year into it, you did fair trade, you had the sustainability aspect of it, all of that. And then you kind of found this niche, you were, you were, your customers were talking to you. Do, do you think that you needed to have that fair trade and sustainability to be able to go into the futsal niche? Um, or, to me, it probably the, helps, but. To, to me, the fair trade was an uncompromising element uncompromising. that I wanted to have in the brand. It was it's just it was a core so, value of you. And, and, yeah, it, in the company. Ex absolutely. Exactly. But just a core value is like, how can you have a ball that is not fair trade? Why cannot, why can't we create a win-win for everybody that the producer gets a fair wage, the consumer yeah. gets a great absolutely. product and that, right. and that we're able to make a profit um, for yeah. us and for our investors. Cool. I think that's cool. the future. That's the future of business, Patrick. You got to create a win-win-win for for everybody involved. You're gonna have to just get big enough to knock off those guys who are not doing fair trade, man. That's gonna happen someday, right? We're gonna lead the way. Yeah, we're <laughs> leading you go, the way. Brother. Sometimes you need smaller, more nimble brands to to be yeah. able to lead the way. Yeah, yeah. It's not always the the big players that that can do it. Yeah. All right. So so take us through this. So so you're one year in. You're, you're not really getting traction. You're going, you know, you're, you're pounding the streets, door to door, all that kind of stuff. And then you, you, the, your customers are reaching out and saying, Hey, you should, you should dive off into futsal. So you listen to your customers. So, so take us down the path after that, man. What, what happened? Yeah. It's not even that they're saying you should go, you should do um, futsal. They're like, do you have futsal balls? Oh, uh, they were for, asking. They were asking for the product, right? Your customers. What's the difference? Not yeah, so a futsal ball is uh, a little bit smaller, it's a little bit okay. heavier, and it has a lower bounce. Um, futsal is five a side in a similar size court as a basketball. So if you have a regular soccer ball, it will bounce all over the place. So this is a smaller ball oh, okay. um, that bounces less. And really futsal, you know, and that's why it's growing so fast in the, in the United States, Patrick, is the sport that a lot of people in um, Spain, in Portugal, in Argentina, in Brazil... Yeah. Yeah. You see guys like Cristiano Ronaldo, like Messi, like um, uh, Neymar, all these guys started playing nothing but futsal until they were like nine or 10 years old. From the size they're like five, six, until like 10, 11, yeah. they're playing nothing but futsal. Right. You get six times as many touches on the ball. You get yeah. uh, a lot less time to think, a lot less space. Right, right, um, right. So, so, so you got this niche board, not only that it's growing, but it's scientifically proven. Um, to create better players for outdoor soccer, either professional yeah. or, or not. So, so for us, it's only a matter of time until the sport grows. And, and that's where I grew up playing in Argentina as well, Patrick. That's why for me, it was a natural fit to, to dive in fully into the sport of futsal and, and aim to become the number one futsal brand first in the United States and then in the world. Awesome. Very cool, man. So, so you went into the, the, the futsal and then, um, you actually, so how, how fast did you grow after that? Was it a pretty, was it, was, did you have to do a lot of reconfiguring? Was there like a, a rapid growth within a year or, or how, how did all that go down? I mean, immediately we saw the traction that all of a wow. sudden futsal balls were, were outnumbering our soccer ball sales. And um, we had the possibility to, to really become the leaders in the market. And that yeah. becomes a lot more fun, Patrick, right? Well, like you said, if you're Absolutely. just one, when you're one more player in a big market, you know that yeah. that's not as fun. But when you can be the reference, when you can um, really lead the market, that becomes a lot more fun. So um, immediately we um, got uh, contacted by U.S. Youth Futsal, 
um, which is the largest organization in the United States for futsal. They have about 45,000 players registered. Um, so they invited me to go to one of their events in Kansas City. And um, shortly after we signed an agreement to become the official ball of US Youth Futsal. Um, this was the year 2014. Um, and we've been partners ever since. So next year is going to be 10 years uh, of this partnership with uh, the United States Youth Futsal. So how did that happen then? I mean, because there was surely there was somebody else already manufacturing futsal. Yeah. What what was it about you about Senda Athletics that the uh, what was the name of the organization again? United States Youth Futsal. U U.S. US Youth Futsal. What 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 was it that they saw about your company that they said, "Listen, I want to make you the official ball of our organization." Our level of focus in the sport, right? They knew that we were a uh, futsal first organization. Commitment to that. Yeah, okay. hyper. Wow. And today you're seeing that, right? You're seeing that consumers want brands that are hyper specialized in in their sport and in the sport that they're doing. So you got people that say, "These are my running shoes. These are the shoes that I wear when I'm lifting weights. These are the shoes that I'm using when I'm just lounging." So consumers now they used to have maybe one brand that would serve all of them. I think now right. they're looking for different brands that specialize in different parts of of their life. And also, to be honest, Patrick, they also like the fair trade. That was the cherry on top that we yeah, talked. Not only yeah. are you hyper-focused, but think about it. These are um, 45,000 players. Most of these players are six to 18 year olds. So, so for mothers, mm -hmm. which make 80% of the purchases in American households, yeah. fair trade matters. If, right, if you right, can give sure. them the same level of convenience that they go to a Dick's Sporting Goods and they find it, that they can get it on Amazon Prime, uh, yeah. that they can go on soccer right, and right. abide along with everything else, and your fair trade, that resonated. So U.S. Youth Futsal was very smart to say, here's somebody that specializes in what I do that also has something that resonates with my key demographics. And that's when it was a natural fit for us to sign that agreement. Man, that's awesome. What, what a story. So um, you also have a bit of a story on, on actually being able to get into uh, uh, Target and Dick's Sporting Goods, right? Or at least Dick's. Yeah, yeah, both of them were very interesting stories. I'll, I'll start with Dick's Sporting Goods. You know, once we knew we had the traction and that we had value to give to them and that the consumers were looking for our products, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I talked to people that had worked there. And one of right. them told me that um, their CEO at the time, Ed Stack, that he still read letter letters that were sent to the headquarters. So we went ahead wow. and um, I wrote a letter and I sent product samples. And I and I I wrote something to the effect of, dear Mr. Stack, it's my honor to, to write to you. Um, I would like to let you know about futsal, this quickly growing sport in the United States. I think there's a growing number of consumers that um, are looking for this in your stores, and I would like um, to be able to be that brand. So it would be a, a fantastic to connect with one of your buyers. And shortly after that, we were able to connect with their buyers. And about nine months after that, we were um, selling on Dix, both online and in stores. And that's crazy. A letter to the CEO that, that he actually read and then took action on it. And it ended up, you ended up being in the stores. Uh, when, was, when did that happen, Santiago? That was in 2000, end of 2020, uh, beginning of oh. 2021. Wow. Like right, right at, right at, at, you know, middle of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. It was during the pandemic. Um, but, uh, you know, we've, we've been super um, happy with them. Their buyers have been tremendous and now with the 2026 World Cup coming to the United States, there's a huge opportunity for, for us to be able to serve the growing number of, of players that are looking to play. And what I'm saying, Patrick, you know, in terms of trends yeah. is that the sport of soccer in the States is becoming a lot more like basketball. It's shaping youth culture. Um, it's getting mixed with R&B, with um, streetwear. And mm. what you're going to see is that people are going to start playing in basketball courts, in tennis courts. It's not going to be the suburban sport that people are driven to in just in minivans um, and, and then picked up from practice. Yeah, right, right. And the youth will play um, wherever they are and they will play. We got next. Um, winner stays. Right, king right. of the court. Queen yeah. of the court. And, and that puts us in a unique place to be at the center of that cultural shift that's happening in, in the United totally. States. Like it does in the rest of the world. You know, the U.S. is one of the few places where it costs a lot of money to play soccer. In most of the world, it's, it's the sport that it's belongs yeah. to the people. Yeah, very cool. So, so okay, so we got the Dicks one. Now, now, tell us about what happened with Target. How'd you get into Target? 
Yeah, so so Target now was the year 2015. So they had launched this campaign called Made to Matter. Um, and it was better for you sustainable fair trade products. You had Kind Bar, uh, Seventh Generations, Method Soap. So this ginormous brands. And um, we saw they launched and then I actually tweeted at Target. And I said, congratulations um, at Target on hashtag Made to Matter. Uh, maybe fair trade soccer balls are next, question mark. And about a week later, we got a call from somebody at Target. I didn't pick up that call. It was one of our interns who yeah. spoke with somebody for about 30 minutes. And when he hung up, he said, that was Target. They want to have a call with you next week to discuss getting into the Made to Matter campaign along with these iconic brands. And um, sure enough, also about nine months later, we were alongside these incredible brands wow. in about 250 Target stores nationwide. Wow, can go. <laughs> that's so awesome. Okay, so so is that for futsal or is that for regular soccer balls? That was for regular soccer balls. We targeted with regular outdoor soccer balls and we had mini size one soccer balls as well. Okay, and so for dicks, are you doing futsal uh, only or soccer balls as well? We're doing we're doing futsal balls. We're doing soccer, uh, soccer balls. We're doing wow. beach beach soccer balls. Uh, wow. We're doing freestyle balls that are for doing tricks in in um different places small small areas they're selling our footwear and they're selling our gravity grip socks as well um, these are the non-slip socks that you mentioned in the beginning uh, that yeah. are good for both soccer and futsal um Got it. and we were uh we worked very hard with the team and in the last world cup final that my team argentina won uh in, <laughs> look at this guy light up <laughs> yeah Love it. In, in qatar we had actually one of the star players, um, Alexis McAllister, number twenty for Argentina. He wore our grip socks in the FIFA foot in the FIFA Soccer World Cup final, nice. uh, and, and that was a dream come true for for me. And and it's incredible for us to see that we have the North Star that is becoming the number one futsal brand in the world, and that it's a sport that's tightly connected with soccer, and that creates a lot of opportunities for us to own the market. Right. Well, at the same time, being very close with an even larger market sure. that's that's strongly connected with with futsal. So, so that's really has been strategically a great business decision, and it has given us tremendous results, both um, you know on the field, like being in a World Cup final without having to play the athlete because the athlete wears the products because they like it, um, to being able to translate some of that to increasing our sales in in futsal as well. So to walk us through your decision to get into like grip socks and, and, and other non-ball related things, how did that come about? Yeah, so grip socks was the later one. I'll start with uh, the first um, vertical that we added after balls, which is footwear. Um, so after about seven, eight years of selling um, futsal balls and going to tournaments, we were really in the grassroots, Patrick. We were going to events. We were with our yeah. community. Um, right. We saw that not only the ball market was um, underserved, but the footwear as well, that people were not finding good footwear in stores, online. And yeah. that's where we, we felt that we had earned the right after serving them for so long with balls to, to do the footwear. And yeah. we talked to our customers. They, they confirmed to us that um, they were having a hard time finding footwear. And that's where in 2019, we added um, footwear um, we started with a Kickstarter campaign. We pre-sold about a thousand pairs of shoes. We put an order for two thousand pairs of shoes, and, and that kicked us off. Today, we have um, six different models for futsal. We also are doing turf shoes for small-sided okay. soccer, um, and that was the vertical. It was just being close to the customer, yeah. listening to them, and seeing what's happening in the marketplace and what other niche markets are unattended uh, that we can really um, lead. Right. Um, that's right. that's what's really exciting for us to be able to lead this category. And after that was grip socks. Um, that was um, we became good friends with somebody who had started a grip socks company um, mm -hmm. in the Netherlands. I was able to go and travel with him to um, create content with different influencers for soccer and futsal. And then in the pandemic, we reached an agreement where we acquired this brand and brought it under the Senda umbrella. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic, man. Um, so w when we talked before, one of the things that you're most proud of as a CEO, you kind of talked about the team we built, um, and, and, and we got, a, got into the question I was asking, which I thought was really good. 
your answers anyways, is, is how you actually built that team. What, what are kind of some of your overarching concepts that have led you to build such an amazing team of people? We hire for culture. You know, we yeah. have a, a, yeah. a, a very clear um, thought on <laughs> who should be in our company. Somebody that puts other people first, yeah. um, the, uh, someone that doesn't have a big ego, somebody yeah. that can admit when they're wrong, um, so we hire for that. And then what, by, by being able to do that, we were able to create this incredible team. We're all working remote, Patrick. We, you know, ever since the pandemic, we've, we've gone fully remote. We got a lot of people that are in Latin yeah. America that are working yeah. from, from overseas. So we're using Zoom, we're using Slack. Uh, we're using all these virtual tools that allow us to work together. And, and I think that makes it that much more important because you are virtual because there's a lot of things that you're not able to it's see. It's hard virtual. Yeah. It, it is that hard to maintain that relationship. Absolutely, Patrick. So culture becomes that much more important um, when, when you're working re remote. So that's what I'm really proud of. And, and then also the products that we were able to work and then how this product resonates with customers. You know, we go to trade shows and our customers, you know, they come to the booth um, three times a day. They yeah. help us to uh, take stuff to the car. Like they really feel that they go own the brand. They're not casual customers. Yeah. They're not people that just come yeah. and transact. They're people that tell their friends about it, tell their colleagues, uh, and that they, they feel invested in the brand. And, and that's something that I'm really proud of to have created this, this community of customers that really believe in what we're doing and that are helping us to grow. Yeah, and I, I uh, man, that that's fantastic. And it, one of the things that uh, you had said before in our pre-call, and I, I saw you even kind of hesitate on it, is is the the no asshole rule. And so we we can curse on here. I didn't know if you if that's what you were kind of contemplating. But, I, I uh, was, I was. <laughs> okay, all right, cool. <laughs> you read my mind, Patrick. I'm like, should I say it or not? But we have that rule. You know, we don't yeah. care what your resume looks like. If you work for an incredible yeah. company, you have a track record. We have that rule that we don't want those kind of people. We know what kind of people. Uh, we need to succeed in and no matter how successful you are or what you can bring to the company we have no room for that in our in in, in send athletics <laughs> so when you're hiring people santiago like you said hire for culture what what are the things that you guys do to to hire for culture that's a great that's a great question patrick um so we do this test one of my mentors he he brought to my attention a, a culture index text test that you can do that you can do virtually that people reply it's not a right or wrong question but they spend about 15 20 minutes answering questions and and then you get a kind of a pretty good idea of how their mind works and, and, and their personality uh, that's not the only thing that we do um, then we also do three stage interviews where different people will interview them and so then we talk internally one person did the first interview another did the second another did the third you know, we have a lot of questions in there about culture and personality besides the competency for the position. And then between the culture results that we get and uh, the different conversations that we have with people that did the different interviews, that's where we look at, does this person uh, fit in our in our Senda culture? So you guys have a process, a, a process and a hiring process in place. Because a lot of people don't, right? I mean, you most of the times it's, you know, it's a CEO or whoever, somebody just kind of sitting down with them in one time and, boop, you know, the winds are in the right direction. We're good to go. Uh, no, hiring is too important to, to do it that way. Yeah, fantastic, man. Is there, is there any um, books or any, uh, uh, is that something you were taught by a mentor or a coach or is there any books that kind of taught you that your method? So this specifically, um, it was it was a mentor that brought it to me. Oh, and fantastic. I'm forever grateful to to him for, for helping us with this. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, very good, man. Um, awesome. So, so let me ask Santiago, if you were going to ask, if you were going to hire a CEO to take over the reins for your company, what's the one book that you would require he or she read before taking over for you? Yeah, to me, I have, I have one that, that comes to mind right away, which is um, Rocket Fuel um, yeah. by Gina Wickman and Mark yep. Winters. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a book that really kind of sets the, the two main profiles that you need to lead an effective organization. And you have a visionary that's, you know, creative, big picture, uh, an ideas person uh, that you kind of visualize the future and it's as clear in your mind as, as you think it's going to be in real life. And, and, and I would be that person that, you know, to me, I, I know where I, I, I want to go. I know where futsal is going to go. I know what this uh, country will look like in, in five, six, seven years. 
especially after the 2026 World Cup. That's going to be a, a paradigm shift for the sport, just like the 1994 World Cup was. But then that's that's not enough. I know the book talks about an integrator, and this is almost the opposite, you know, to somebody that's very detail oriented, that's all about execution, uh, that's very cautious. You know, I get very excited about ideas. I want to go very far, uh, very quickly. And then, you know, um, I was lucky enough to find an integrator who is my um, COO. Um, nice. His name is, is, is Javier. And, and he's able to 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 help balance me. And together, we and it's a balance. If we have two creators or we have yeah. two visionaries, the work cannot yeah. be done. You know, yes. you think about another iconic company uh, that that the book talks about, Apple, right? You got Steve Jobs and you got Wozniak, right? And and, and normally the the yeah. integrators they're more introvert, they're more like Absolutely. behind the scenes. Right, um, right. But uh, Jobs would not have done what he did without Wozniak to 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 play the role that he played. And, and I couldn't do what I'm doing without my integrator, um, Javier, who's who's been an incredible um, asset to, to the company and, and to me personally, to be honest. So that would be the, the one book that I recommend anybody that's building an organization to, to read, Patrick. Absolutely, man. I couldn't agree more. I think it's a fantastic book. It, it's, it's groundbreaking, uh, really revolutionized how founders and CEOs um, can, can really scale the business most effectively, really bringing that out. And I know he talked about it in his book, Traction, a little bit, you know, having that 2IC, the, the second in charge person. But uh, in Rocket Fuel, that's what the whole book is about, is if you're a visionary, you need that person who is boots on the ground, taking care of all the day-to-day -day operations in the company, the operations, so you can focus on the key things. So yeah, Absolutely. Man, thank, thanks for bringing that book up. I, I, I love that book. Um, Santiago, awesome having you show. I want to take a few minutes and just summarize some of my key takeaways. Um, one is, is, is listen to the voice of your clients. Always, always be actively reaching out, you know, and, and listening to your clients and then do something about it. And in your case, it really paid off. You know, you had enough people coming to you saying, hey, do you offer futsals? And, and, and that's the direction you went into. Um, and, and then on top of that is, is not only listening to your, to your, to your, clients, but niche markets. Look for the niche. I mean, the riches are in the niches. They always say that, right? And, and it's true for, for, for your uh, instance, especially. And so people are willing to pay more for hyper and commitment and loyalty for hyper specialization in their industry. Uh, two more big things that I got was uh, hire for culture, right? Uh, and I think, you know, if there's, if there's CEOs out there and leaders who are paying attention at all, if they're paying attention, if they're reading the books that are out there, you know, there's a huge shift in business of America or, or around the world as well, where they're starting to hire for culture, where that wasn't the case 10, 15, 20 years ago. And so um, don't be one of those companies left behind. And the last one was, was this rocket fuel, this concept of having a second in charge to run the day-to-day -day of your business. Otherwise, you just end up failing, just not being as, as productive. So um Santiago, if there was one takeaway that you would really want the audience to absorb from our time together today, what would that be? For me, it comes down to what you just summarized as well, like finding a niche market and finding um, something that you can be the best in the world. I know, like you said, Patrick, there's huge companies in, in our space, yeah. in yeah. you know sports and, yeah. and software as a whole. But I know that, that I can be and we're well on our way to be Absolutely. the best futsal and small-sided soccer brand in the world and, and and that's what i wake up thinking about and what i yeah. go to sleep thinking about and and i think that that has changed my business and it's a lot more fun when you can wake up uh, and think about being number one at something yes i love it man awesome so uh we'll have your linkedin profile on the podcast page but if any of our listeners want to reach out and get a hold of you or senda uh, athletics for for anything how uh, is there any other ways that you would like them to do that yeah they can email me directly i'm santiago at senda athletics s-e-n-d-a and then the word athletics and then i'm i'm on i'm on social if people put my name i'm, I'm on instagram i'm linkedin i'm facebook always looking to connect with like-minded people and um, people in the in the business world very cool well santiago uh amazing having you on the show thanks again for for being here Thank you for having me, Patrick. I really enjoy our conversation and I learned a lot as well. Awesome. And for the audience, please hit the like and subscribe button and help us spread the word about the show and what we're doing here. We're helping the next generation of leaders and CEOs be that much more successful. With that, this is your host, Patrick Rogers, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks a lot.